We're ready to go. G4 Guitar Teacher Network. My name is David Hart, and what we're going to do here is chat to the guys from around the globe and talk about the two topics we've got today already off the bat, which are the, going to be the main topics, but we'll also do questions as always. There's no, there's never a hard set agenda to this. We just try and tackle whatever problems and whatever questions people have. Okay, so the the we'll, today what we'll do is we'll start on the topics. We'll we'll go through them first, and then we'll use the the, the rest of it for questions because this is this was what, what it was raised for. Um, now the topics that were that I think wanted to discuss were talking about how to use the practice log and the checklist, which I know you guys know roughly how to use them, and that's all good. But I guess you probably just have some questions. And I wasn't at Emma's session, so I don't know what was raised there. Uh, perhaps if some one of you guys who was there, uh, Ben, um, were you there the other the other night on Monday night? No. Was that and was I there? I was there. Yeah. yeah. Were you there? Okay, great. So what what was it? Why did Emma raise this? She said to talk about the practice logs and checklist. Was there something that came up? Do you, you remember? We were talking about when you introduced the checklist, and. It turns out there was a bit of a discrepancy there. I always mention it very briefly in the first lesson and say, we'll be referring back to this. Whereas I think it was, Jay, was it you who said that David told you in the, well, not David told you, you saw in a video from a long time ago, yeah. don't introduce yeah, yeah, it until lesson saying, five. It was a long time ago that I, you know, I, I remember <laughs> watching it. But I do remember see, seeing, in, uh, seeing one of the videos where David says that, do not introduce the checklist until after the fifth lesson. Am I right, David? Correct. Absolutely correct. Yes, the the checklist. the The idea is that we we what we're going to do is use the introduction to introduce different skills for the asset itself. It's okay to say that there will be checklists because I'll probably figure that out anyway. Um, and Shane, can I just get you to mute your mic just because there's a bit of noise? Good. Um. So the yeah. So, but don't don't really bring it up as far as bringing it out and showing them this is the checklist, this is what we're going to be doing. What you want to, the reason you want to do that at the end of the introduction is because that builds anticipation for what's coming next. In other words, now we've done the intro, now you understand the guitar and, and, and the skills and the kind of things that we're going to be doing. Uh, from next week when you join the group, you'll be starting on this checklist. And it's okay to give them the checklist in that week five, uh, but just explain that that's what's going to be happening is you're going to be working on that checklist. So so you don't get this situation which happens a lot where people get to the end of week five and go, thanks very much, I've got plenty to work on here, uh, great method, uh, you're a great teacher, but give me give me six months and I'll come back to you. Um, what, you, what, you what you want to avoid is that situation and, and by presenting the checklist at the end of it, what you're really doing is saying stick around because this is what's coming up. Does that make sense everyone? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, uh, one thing we were saying, David, was that we weren't sure if it was going to be useful. I think me and David both thought it was benefiting us in guiding their practice. So by showing them it in the first lesson, they wouldn't really remember it. And around the third or fourth lesson, I think, is when I remind them. We've, we've kind of almost come full circle. We're about to start finishing off the skills. And I say, so you're still practicing this and this. Remember, check this page here. That's your targets. So that, that's where the... It seems to make it a lot clearer for some, especially my kind of 50 plus students. They always yeah. said, I'm trying to practice, got the time to practice, putting the time in, never exactly sure what I'm doing. And while I gave them different options and different ways to practice things without the checklist, without knowing where they're eventually aiming, they seem to be unsure what's the best way to practice this. So even though they're doing well, practicing, improving, they want to know that they're improving in the right areas. Okay, this is great because what it's doing is it's raising an issue um, and the issue is that they're saying to you, I'm not sure exactly what to practice. And what we want to do in the introduction is keep it very, very simple so that they don't need to actually refer to anything, that, they, that it's so simple that they know they walk away in their head knowing what to practice. Now, one of the things that I do, the techniques that, that's, that you know, I learned this years ago, but it's, it's a very powerful technique and that's at the end of your lesson, is to say, what are you going to practice this week? You, you, you show me what you're going to practice. 
And that way what that does is it yeah. gets them, and you can even say that at the beginning of the lesson, I want you to listen very closely because at the end of the lesson I'm going to be asking you what you're going to practice. So, so you know, if you need to stop, you need to take notes, you need me to repeat, you say it because at the end I'm going to ask you. Um, and so what you want them to do is walk out of there not with needing to refer to a piece of paper but to actually knowing, okay, what I need to do this week. So week one, what I need to do is just pick down and up and play these very simple one finger chords. That's all I need to do. Um, I'll go away. I'll work on that. And and you, you do get those times where you've got students who will say, "Is that all? You know, isn't there anything else to? You know, can I? Can you give me a song or a riff or something that's a, a bit fun?" Um, and and my thing, my my response to that is, I could give you more, but I want to see if you can stick to this this week. If you can get these skills down, if you do, then next week I'll bump it up and I'll give you more things to work on. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Can I ask okay, a wider cool. question, or am I interrupting too, too long? It, it, yeah, as long as it's on this topic, as long as we stick to this topic, no problem. Yeah, it's with the checklists then. In the general lessons from group onwards, yeah. are you kind of running each lesson when you do two skills? Are you aiming to only really cover what's on the checklist? Uh, so when yes, I'm doing chords, I, I should have yeah. done just C, then C and G7, then C, G7 and G, adding them in one at a time until they're entirely covered, never mentioning anything else. Chords is a poor example because you're not going to jump ahead in chords. But Yeah, c kind of. The, the concept is, is, is kind of taken from different places. And what, what I did you know, when developing the method was really think about where, where is their success? Where, what areas can I look around and see examples of success in coaching and teaching. Uh, yeah, and, and one of the areas was sport. And a classic example for me in Australia is, is swimming and squat swimming. And when you go and watch the swimmers train and they're doing their swimming, they're not throwing balls around and jumping around and you know making jokes and having fun. What they're doing is they're training uh, to hopefully go to, to the representative swimming and then go to state and maybe if they're really good, have a shot at the Olympics. Um, so they're very clear about what they're doing. They're swimming up and down a pool. They're developing the strokes that are needed to be able to do that. And compared to guitar, it's very narrow, very specific, um, and they end up getting to a point where they end up specialising in maybe one or two strokes. So, and another another area is is martial arts, where you know they again work on set moves, particular particular situations, and they have to set to train those skills, and then they get when they 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 reach a certain level with those skills, they get a certain belt and then they move up through the different belts until they get to their black belt and so forth. So I thought in, in, in the world of guitar, this doesn't really happen, especially the world of rock and pop guitar. This is very kind of loose, hey, man, hey, dude, what do you want to do? Um, you know, but you don't see this a lot in classical instruments. In classical instruments, are, it's a lot more uh, organized and structured. Uh, you know, in, in traditional instruments all around the world, the structure is, is nearly always there. It was really just this kind of rock era that came out of the 50s where it was so, you know, it's all about rock and roll, man. It's just about doing whatever feels good and, and going for it. And, and I'm part of that era, so I, I totally get that and appreciate it. Um, but at the same time, I felt frustrated, especially as a teenager, because I wasn't getting these fundamental skills down. And then, you know, I witnessed other guys who had done, especially guys who had done classical training and some of the jazz players as well, and their technique was just phenomenal. And I was like, man, you, you're, you're in two years, three years, you've got this awesome tech, uh, technical ability. Uh, where did you get that? Oh, I did classical training. Um, you know, I haven't seen, you know, with Van Halen and, and those guys, they did a lot of classical piano when they were kids for years, I think. Um, so... What what G4 was about was creating that structure and giving people a kind of a discipline. And when they come in for the half an hour lesson in that 30 minutes, yes, the checklist is what we're focusing on because what we're trying to get them to do is, is have that structure. Go off and do your rock and roll. Go off and do whatever you like, you know, between your, your sessions and, and in, in, in outside of your, your structured practice, if you like. But here I'm going to teach you how to actually develop the skills that will give you that basis to then be able to do whatever you want. Because you're not going to be able to play like Joe Cicerani, um or you know anybody of, of that caliber um, without structured discipline practice. It's not going to happen. Uh, and if, if you just want to be, you know, play some basic rock and roll riffs, sure. 
Um, but if you want to go beyond that, you need to have this structure, and that's really what we're teaching them, and that's what we want G4 to kind of build the reputation around, is that we'll give you the skills that will then give you the ability to go on and do whatever you want to do. So does that answer your question about sticking to I know it's a long-winded answer, but I think it's good to get the background. Uh, slightly. I, I see what you're saying about people asking for more, but when they ask for more from me, it's such, give me a song or give me something funner. It's more, okay, so is this how that works? And what about this? And, for example, when we were talking about the chords, no, sorry, not the chords, the scales, and I mentioned the note, he was like, oh, so that's an E. But I thought these were both E's. And I was like, yeah, there's an E here and here and here and here and here. And here. And that developed into a five-minute discussion about why things are set out on the guitar as they are, and talking about music theory and how the piano is how it all started. But you can see our chords, we can't build them like pianos. Yep. And he wasn't okay. a beginner, so he knew he, he was happy looking at that bar chord and thinking what's going on there. But it wasn't sticking to the structure in that any time they ask me something outside the structure, I'm happy to answer that, but they then get a bit distracted. Okay. So you would so what, what really runs to the checklists in the, you, you, I'm doing these two skills, so I'm doing exercises that are only focusing on getting that and only focusing on getting that. Yes, and and what, what you want to do, this is, see, this is where, if you see the opportunity in this, this is a huge opportunity, and, and that is that, that when students are asking you questions that are off topic, what you want to do is, is write those questions down and say, Look. I'm going to... I'm going to send you a video or come and join me on Facebook and I'll answer that question for you because right now we're doing the skills. We're focusing on, on the, the, the program. Uh, but outside of here, again, it's a bit, you know, if I go back to sport and, you know, I go back to the squad swimmers training up and down the pool, it's a bit like them saying to the coach, um, you know, so why do, you know, why is the pool this big? You know, why isn't it a 30-metre pool? Who made it 50 metre? Who decided it to be a 50 metre? And the coach goes, well, Go and look it up on Wikipedia or uh, contact me after training and I'll tell you about it. But right now, stick to the training. Go and do me another day. Um, That's a good analogy. That's exactly what it feels like when they ask these kind of questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's really about a, you, it's a coaching session and you really want to keep them focused. And now, because often it's the ones who ask a lot of questions, which is great. I, I'm all for the questions because the curious ones, you, you, you want to keep them uh, you, know, you want to give them answers and you want to provide solutions for them and ways for them to find solutions. But you also want to be sure that when you're when you're doing this, uh, that and when you know when you in that situation that you don't get off track and try and write those questions down and then find ways to answer those questions. And that's where you know the Facebook group with you guys is is great because you guys are asking questions. I don't have to stop what I'm doing to answer the question. I can come on there a couple of times a day and then I can focus on answering those questions, whereas it doesn't interrupt my flow of the work and, and my day that I have, so I'm still getting projects done. But if you, if I had a, and I don't even have a mobile phone for that very reason because I don't want it to ring. Um, so, if, you know, if you guys are ringing me every, you know, every day and all of you are doing it, I would never get any done because I'd be getting interrupted all the time. So when you're in the flow of the lesson, you want to keep the lesson going that's something, a question that one particular student has. Yes, the others might benefit from it as well, but right now, uh, we, we may or may not know that, but right now we need to focus on the skills, the development, but I will get an answer for you on that question. Thanks for the question. Sort of thing. Cool. So adults well. and parents, Facebook group, maybe videos as well. Kids, just get them to write down their questions, beat them at the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or get their parents to get involved with the Facebook group and then they can ask you the questions via that. Yeah, yeah. If it, look, there's lots of ways to do it, but yeah, if you can, if you can, and, and really, what you want to do is is part of the whole. You know, think about what I'm doing as far as bringing you guys into this kind of situation where you are um, getting all the kind of support or different things you need from different angles. It's it's much more value. You know, I do these hangouts, but but there's a lot more value through the Facebook group, through the resources, uh, through the uh, Evernote uh, knowledge base, through the website. So by having all these different channels, um, what I'm doing is creating extra value and support for you guys. And if you can do the same uh, for your students, you can start thinking about that, or we can even think about it as a group. 
if you've got these questions coming up, students are asking, maybe post it up on Facebook and go, does anyone know of a video or you know something that I can send this guy because he wanted to know about you know the fretboard and the different notes and uh, whatever your question, whatever those questions are, and let's see if we can build up a knowledge base for our students as well because again that extends value to all of your students. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, are there any other questions on? The practice log or checklist because I, I, I've got a few points here I can bring on. But was there anything else? Um, maybe if I go to Shane, Shane or Jay, sorry, Jay, because I know you were there. Was there anything that you had regarding uh, the checklists? Oh, nothing really. But I have a question about cooking exercise. Okay. So, yep. Um, some of my students are getting really good at picking uh, to the point of you know them being bored. <laughs> so every time they come here. When we when we begin the picking exercise, I can see it in their faces. They're they're really bored because they find the down up down up on one string um, too easy now. So my question is, would it be okay if I uh, add some left hand synchronization with that, like the chromatic scale runs with the down up down up? So to make it interesting and uh, more challenging for them as well. Um, y yeah. Um, well, the thing is about the picking is that it's you are isolating the right hand, and yeah. it's and that's really important to keep them aware of that isolation. Um, look, I would what I would do something something to do is to maybe pull up a video of you know John Petrucci or something picking at you know a million miles an hour, absolutely accurately, absolutely articulately, and say so how did how did he get like that? Do you guys think how did he get so good? Because um, he did the boring stuff over and over and over again. Um, so if you, when you're feeling bored, that's the time to keep going. That's the time not to give up because that's when most people stop. That's when most people decide this is boring. They move on to something else, and guess what? They end up getting uh, very average at many, many things. And this is this is the thing is that we don't want to and be very careful. We don't want to be taking our students off what we know is good for them. Um, just because they're bored. What we want to do is uh, try and find a different way to keep them on it. So, and, and I do this all the time with the G4 method, as, as you guys know, through the whole process, is that I'm very careful about, you know, I see it almost like uh, going to a doctor. Just because I don't like the taste of the medicine, uh, the doctor's not going to say, oh, well, don't take it then, um, if I really need it. If it's what's going to make me better, um, it doesn't matter whether I like the taste or not. Um, the doctor's going to say, oh, well, I'm sorry, we'll work on a different recipe, um, but you really have to take this medicine. And so you're kind of wanting to do the same thing, and you're just looking for ways to motivate them and to, just to, for them to understand the value of this and, and how. And well, one of the angles that I always used, which worked extremely well, is I, I would say to them, you know how you feel now? You feel bored with this exercise, picking down and up and down and up and down and up all the time. You know how you feel. And they go, yeah, it's really boring, but like, well, guess what? Everybody feels that way. But what makes the 1% are the ones who keep doing it anyway, who push past the boredom. Because when you do it, you're just going to get better. You're going to refine it more and more. And, you know, doing things like having challenges such as can you reduce the movement in your hand till you get your picking down so you're still picking very fast or accurately, but with very little movement, so I can hardly see your hand moving. Um, or you know, can we can we try everybody trying the metronome? Let's see. We'll, we'll gradually speed the metronome up to see who can keep up and who can. So they have these kind of little challenges, and they come each week, and they're vying for that kind of top position of uh, you know picking faster than the others. You know what I'm saying, Jay? Yes, yes, yes. I understand that. And it's a great. Yeah. These are great ideas that you've just uh, said. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, especially the metronome. I'm really fond of uh, using the metronome and you know pushing up their speed a little bit. Um, I might as well try that next session. Cool, cool, great. So, Thanks. yeah, no worries. Um, the, the the one thing I'll just add to the end there is that uh, when you're doing these kind of things and doing these kind of exercises, um, put putting. Putting some excitement into it, which I know you probably do anyway, but that, that's one of the things that I always do. I'd always show them, man, this is going to be so good. When you get 
you know, when you get this fast, you know, I play for them and go, you guys are going to be at this level soon. Stick it out, dude. You know, stick to it. Trust me. Uh, and because what I was trying to do was create a, a and, and, and I did in many ways with, with the G4 schools, is create a standard of, of guitar uh, tuition or practice uh, that really made my students stand out, you know, their schools, amongst their friends, so they could really see their progress. And so, yeah, sticking, the, the less that they do, the more, the better they will get. It's better that they just do a few things uh, and get really good at them because that's how they, they will become uh, confident and then on the okay, well, I can transfer that same approach to something new, something else. They don't have to be, uh, you know. I always come back to one of my favourite quotes is the Bruce Lee quote of, you know, the ten thousand. I, I, I fear not the not the man who who's done ten thousand different kicks, but I fear the man who's done one kick ten thousand times. Um, so the, you apply that same thing. Let's just do a few things. Let's do them really, really well. Okay. Um, yes. Love it. Yeah, I was just going to make a suggestion because I was having the same problem as Jay um, and, um, you know, they started complaining and so on. But when you look at, when you, when you, they always want to go faster. And I've noticed that even when they want to learn their own songs of the ultimate song list, they also race through it and I can see how sloppy they're playing. So I said to them, slow down, slow down. I was trying to remind them, slow down. Even when you're learning your own song, slow down. If you want to sound good, if you want to have good technique, you've got to slow down. But um, I, I wish I could say it the way you say it, David, because the way you say it, I know you've got a lot of experience, and you just know how to say it so that you can motivate them. Um, anyway, I'm going to watch this later again. Um, the thing that, I'm, that I've been trying to do is, um, um, uh, you know how there's a, a big list of all the exercises? I've, yeah. been give, I, I've been getting someone in the class to count us in, and that person that counts in gets also to choose which exercise to do. So if it's like the, you know how there's about like maybe 10 lines. So we go through all those lines together. We do them for two, like one minute. Then we go to the next one and so on. And that seems to sort of um, get them focused and stop thinking about, oh, we're going too slow. We're doing this again. And it seems to be helping. Um, and I've noticed there's a little bit of improvement in their picking. But in in the in this particular team that I'm thinking of, where there's three kids um, uh, at the age of 12, um, they they did be, get very sloppy with their technique, and um, and I yeah. guess that's one strategy you can use, like to to get them involved in that way. Maybe that could help Jay too. Good idea. Yeah, excellent idea. Um, I, I I like what you were saying there. Uh, you know, by turning it into a game as well, like you know, giving the turns of counting it in and, and you know and picking and choosing um, because the more you can sort of do that the more involved they feel uh, in the exercises and they look especially the younger kids they look forward to their turn um, you know working with with Mia at the moment I've got this situation where um, I you know it's one of the things that I included in in the uh, um, the parent guide but but basically what I what I did is I wrote all these things down on pieces of paper for exercises for her to do, you know, it might be like do a, a reading exercise from the PGM or do a picking exercise or a rhythm exercise or, or whatever. Um, but what, what happened w was that I sort of, you know, it was about a week ago, um, I just said, okay, let's do our practice. I want you to do this first, I want you to do that. And she started to get upset. And I said, what's wrong, sweetie, what's wrong? And she said, you didn't let me pick. Oh, okay. <laughs> so she, she wanted to be able to pick them out of the thing. Um, and so, yeah, okay, cool. So, uh, so she's got really attached to that game now of picking out. So, and it's it's great because you can control it. So, for example, if you have two skills that you're that you're going to work on today, you know, let's say uh, scales and, and reading, then you can actually have a, a bunch of these things in in a just on those skills. You can have them in different boxes, and you can go around and go, all right. Um, you know, Johnny, it's your ch your turn to pick out and picks one out, and it's one of the things. Maybe there's only three or four things in there for them to do, but you, they pick out one of the things that you want them to do, um, and then that's what they work on. Um, and then some of the picking exercises you can pick from the different exercises. This works really well with the younger kids. Um, I wouldn't suggest it with adults, but um, with <laughs> with the young kids, it works well. So it, um, with the uh, with the adults, um, I get them to pick the line anyway, so they. So I get them to choose which line you want to do, and then we just go through that line. But right. yeah, with the little kids, 
only two weeks ago I started doing Lucky Dips yeah. and all these games that are in the in the book and they're working. The little kid that wouldn't practice at all, he would just sit there and change conversation. Um, you know, he wouldn't even do what I tell him. Now with the Lucky Dips, um, he's doing them and also every time he does a task, he gets a, a, a certain amount of points. If the task is on the guitar, he gets three points. If it's an answer question, he gets one point. If he plays another game like, um, you know, choosing notes, he gets another point. And then at the end, we, we always try to get about 20 points and the parents are happy and then they think of a reward for the child. And it seems to Fantastic. be working because this kid wouldn't play at all. Fantastic. It, it, it does and that's great. That's such a great example. And, and it really does work when you start getting into it. And the reason a lot of teachers don't do it is just because it feels like more work for them. They think, oh, you know, just do it, kid, you know. Um, you know, I have those days and I just wish that me would just do it, you know, why do I have to play all these games, you know, um, why can't you just do what I tell you to do, um, but <laughs> kids don't work like that, uh, you know, and you're beating your head against the wall if you try. Um, that's great, excellent example, and it, and once you get used to it, it just gets easier. Sorry, Lala, you go? Yeah. yeah, one more thing before I forget about what Jay said earlier, I have a day, you know how you do, um, uh, you do warm up? and then two skills and then the song at the end. Um, well, usually if you can stick to that. Um, but I also have a day where one of the skills that we look at are combining right and left hand picking. So that way, what Jay mentioned, what he wanted to include, I have a day where I include that maybe with scales or something like that. Okay, so, cool. so on that day I have left and right techniques like the John Petrucci exercises. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then I have, um, and then we look at a scale and then we get into a song or something like that. Fantastic, excellent, and so this kind of leads me in, which is good, um, of talking about you know what the kind of the practice log and the checklists are about. And if you understand these, these are just some points. If you can understand these points of what they're really about, um, then you, you'll never kind of you won't as a teacher lose focus on what you're trying to do with them and and and, and how powerful they really are. And, and so I'll just go, and you will have seen, hopefully you've seen this in the training anyway, but it's something that you've got to be reminded of and you've got to keep reminding yourself of. Um, so I'll just quickly go through them. The first one with the, pre uh, the practice, of, obviously, is it shows that you care, and, and we've talked about this many times. Um, if you don't track practice and you don't look at their practice log every week when they come in first thing, then it's very easy for them to, to assume, and probably rightly so, that you don't care less whether they practice or not. Um, so that's the first thing, and you don't even need to ask. You should never ask the question. So what? How did you? What did you practice? How much did you practice? You should never ask how much did you practice, um, because um, so the 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 thing is okay. So what's going to happen is that if you can check that practice at the beginning of every single lesson when you start, then that will give you a very clear. Uh, a clear idea of how that student's going as well, so it sort of works two ways. It's one of them understanding that you care about their practice and the other is that you are actually able to tap into to where they're at. So that's why the practice log is so important. The second thing is it creates accountability, uh, which is something that makes your lessons valuable. If you're accountable, uh, if, sorry, if you make them accountable, then they will actually value your lessons more. If there's no accountability happening, then they don't. Th th there's a big reason for them not to come to your lessons anymore. If it's just about getting information from you, about learning from you, you know, it's like going to. I, I, you can go to a personal fitness coach, right? One of the, the really the only reason I see to go to a personal fitness coach is for accountability, because all the exercises are online on YouTube. There's a million different physical exercises you can do, and uh, fitness regimes and apps that you can use, and a million things that you can do. You don't need a personal fitness coach for any of that stuff, but what you do need them for is to keep you accountable, to ring you at six in the morning and go, let's go. You know, um, So that's really important if to, for that reason, and if you're not taking that into to big consideration in, with what you're doing, then you're missing uh, yeah, a very important part of the practice log. And the third thing about practice logs is that it shows the student and the parent their investment. So if they've just spent six months learning with you, one of the things that, that and this really occurred to me, uh, I actually learned this from someone else, but it, but it, it hit me like a ton of bricks when, when I realized it was happening. 
Um, and that is that students look at their practice log and they go, wow, I have invested a lot of time here. I can't turn back now. It's like being on a map and, and journeying halfway up a mountain and going, well, we've come this all this way, so I'm not going to stop now. And not having a practice log, they don't actually see it that way. Someone can be learning guitar. Think, think about yourself. Who here can tell me how many hours of practice they've done in their lifetime? Does anyone actually know how many hours of practice they've done? No, right. So imagine if you could know. Imagine if you, you could now look back on the number of hours you practice, and I would say for most of you we're talking thousands of hours. Then you would realise the investment that you've made into guitar. Um, and it's probably more than the investment that you've made in, in many things in your life. Um, but that investment is something that you're not willing to give up now. And so the more aware you are of the investment that you make in anything, the less likely you are to give up on it. And so that's a really important thing. And it, 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 if you're if they're comparing different things like their basketball, their, their you know their baseball, their soccer, whatever, they're com comparing those things and they're comparing their guitar, and you're you're getting them to to, to actually write their practice down, keeping a practice log then they now have a very clear idea of how much they're investing in, into their guitar versus anything else, which starts to lift the, the investment there. It's, it's extremely powerful stuff. It's a psychological thing that, go, that we all do, but the more that we know and we measure, then the more aware we become of that commitment and investment. All right. If, anyone, if anyone's got any questions, throw them up um, any time. Yeah, uh, I had a question about the picking. Yep, go Shane. Um, so at 80 beats per minute, as it says in the checklist, yep. is that one pick per, per click, or is it in eighth notes? Yep. Uh, one, one, one pick per, it, well, it, it doesn't, the, the actual, uh, the rate that I've got there on the tempo is one pick per click. That's where I started at, uh, because I, I yeah. do everything very slowly to begin with. Uh, but of course, if you've got students who are more advanced, then you know, I, I would have at times have students who were doing eighth notes instead of quarters, um, okay. just because they were capable of it. Yeah, yeah I, I was just, I was just wondering because it's a bit unclear. But I usually do that start at eighty, and then most students can get to eighty and eighth notes within by the time they're getting ready yeah. to finish the the level one checklist. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's really, uh, you know, it's. It, as, as you know, it's about the quality of the picking. It's, it's the, the, the speed will come. Uh, we all know this stuff. I don't need to tell you guys. So. Um, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm glad you, you asked that because it is an important question. And um, yep. Uh, I was just going to say, I also had a comment about Jay's thing earlier with the, with the picking, is that when, when a student says, oh, I'm, I'm done with it, I usually say, well, if you can do it faster than I can, with the metronome, then you're done with it. Of course, no one can. So <laughs> I think that's a good. pretty good challenge. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Exactly. And and when they can do it faster than you, then you've got a potential teacher on your hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Fantastic. Yeah, it, that that's it. And it, and you know, even if they went beyond me, you know, I. I I, I mean, some of the students got close, I have to say, um, but e even if they did, I would just then start saying, okay, you're ready to start playing like Petrucci or somebody else, you know. Um, you, you've got to go to the next level. One of the things that I used to do was um, eye of the tiger, um, you know, and try and get them steady on that because that's the first challenge as far as I'm concerned. Keep that steady, keep the picking steady on eye of the tiger. When you can do that, then we'll look at going faster, but don't tell me that you're bored or you're over it until you can actually hold, you know, these faster tempos. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so, sorry, David, I just had another yeah. sure. question about the picking. I just um, just wanted to bring it up because I have one student who, he's he's on junior level two at the moment, and, and he can actually play pretty well. He can play the... Batman thing, which isn't that easy, I don't think, but he does it pretty well, and he does all the skills, and he knows a lot of chords, but the poor kid just cannot play in time, and we use a lot of the beginning of every lesson trying to get him to play in time with the metronome, 
and he just can't do it. And and he's filling in his practice log, and I can see he's practicing the other skills. And and I keep every lesson I ask him, Are you sure you have a metronome at home? Are you practicing with it? And short of calling him a liar, I don't know what else to do because he's really just not. He just can't physically play with the metronome, which for someone who's approaching an intermediate level, I think is quite odd. I was just wondering if anyone had any comments about that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my, my yeah. first take on that, because obviously I've struck that a few times. Um, you, you know, there's possibly a, what I call rhythmic dys dyslexia um, there, where they, they just can't get it, they just don't hear the tempo all the time. Um, but, you know, it's very rare, I think, if, even if there is such a thing. And the, a good way to do it is to to see what, what songs they like or, or a song that they like and then just ask them to tap along to their favourite song um, and to see if they can do it because that really, you know, if someone likes a song and they're into a song, they can generally groove to it, they can generally stay in time with it. Now, a metronome, some, for some people, because, you don't know, it's, it, it's, some people have trouble with net metronomes even though they, I've found that they can tap along to a song. Uh, for some reason, maybe the song does something that's got more pulse going, uh, whatever. So try that first, just to see that there's absolutely no ability there to keep in time. Um, the, the, the other thing, the kind of things that I would do would be things like getting them to just simply clap on the first beat of the bar. So just with me, you know, maybe strumming one, two, three, four, and then one, getting them just to clap on that first beat each time to see if they can manage that. Um, if they can't even manage that, then what I do is I get them to walk with me and I get them to go right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, walking at a, at a pace. Um, and, and then what I do is get them to clap on, say, the right, right, left, right, left, right, left, keeping that. And then I might, you know, with a metronome in my hand, um, get them walking with the metronome. So the metronome's clicking and so we're walking at the same pace as the metronome. I keep trying to find if there's, if there's any sense of rhythm because it's very, very rare that someone doesn't have a sense of rhythm and timing. Uh, you know, I think it's... Yeah. it's we, I think we need to have it, to be honest. I think uh, I don't know the science behind it, but I think of different situations where you do need a certain amount of rhythm and timing. You need to be able to time how fast the car's going before you cross the road so you don't get run over. Uh, you know, you need when you're on a push bike, you you need to actually get the pedals moving at a certain pace. Um, you know, just there's lots of situations. Even walking itself is is kind of a rhythmic exercise. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, you know, is this in a group situation? You've got this kid? Uh, no, because he's the only kid I have on junior level two, so he's by himself. Yeah. I would I would forget every, every other skill and just focus on rhythm until you can work it out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because that, that can be the one. So I've, I've got a friend um, who, who actually was the one who introduced me to, to guitar when I was about 13 years of age. Um, I went to his house, he had a bunch of electric guitars and the guy's a big Yugoslav guy, big strong hands. Um, he was like, you know, 13 at the time, he was 13 going on 21. He was big, strong. And he'd get the guitar and he'd be doing these bends and, you know, and whammy bar and the whole thing going on. Um, and he was right into Van Halen at the time. And it, it just, it's like, wow, man, I wish I could do all that stuff. And then he got me learning drums and then I, so I took up drums and started playing and here I was, you know, I'd been learning for about six months and we kept trying to have jams and just couldn't get it together and I was thinking, what, what's wrong with me? You know, you've been playing guitar for years. I think you've been playing guitar for three years or something, right? And I kept thinking, we just can't get this together. Maybe I should give up the drums, maybe I'm just not made, cut out for it. But then I realised that it was him, not me. Um, <laughs> even though he could play guitar, he actually had never practised with a metronome. Even though he owned a metronome, um, his timing was woeful and to this day, uh, he was nicknamed many years ago 5 4 uh, because for obvious reasons. Um, but but uh, we, yeah, he still can't play in time. And and I, you know, I don't know, but I honestly think it was just that he never, because I could never get him to sit down and, and work on very basic exercises. He was just always in a hurry to, to learn the other stuff. 
Um, yeah. And it's a shame because he's a, he is a great, great feel. Um, you know, everything else he was doing really well, but when it came to actually playing in time, basic in time, he couldn't do it, and he still can't do it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So uh, I would, I would just, the, sorry, the moral to that story is uh, that get it right, otherwise it may never get fixed, and it may be something that uh, holds him back forever more. Yeah. Um, I was going to add something to that, David. I saw Lalo had his hand up as well. Do you want to go first, Lalo, or are you, are you done? Lalo, did yeah, you want to yeah, add? I, yeah, I've got the same the same issue. This, um, so I'm spending more time on rhythm, and this particular student also admitted to not having rhythm to dance as well. So we're doing a few working on a few things, tactics to try and get that rhythm um, issue taken care of. He's improving. Beautiful. Yeah. Excellent. Sorry, okay, Ben? Uh, yeah, what I was going to say was a couple of things that you didn't mention. Uh, I just saw Jay pointed out. You might be playing too loud to hear the clicks because before I started plugging my speaker in, well, you know, Bluetooth speaker, but, you know, same thing, it was quite hard for them to, or for some students to And the ones that, once the person in question came to a group, I was slightly worried because I wouldn't be able to play in time. Perfect. The moment there was some human interaction, it was like the metronome, this brings me to the second point, the metronome's a bit further removed from the guitar and from their thinking, whereas someone else playing in time with them, it's more relevant. And the further removed it is, the harder it is for them to focus on both at once. So I found the more I say, ignore your hand, trust that your hand will be picking, only listen to the metronome. Listen to the metronome, tell your hand to pick down on that first beat and then just see if you can only listen to the metronome and follow along. Don't think whether you're picking accurately or anything. And obviously we'll then bring it back to picking accurately and make sure that they've got good, good technique. But to make sure they're playing in time, forget entirely that they're on the guitar. So that's why the clapping worked for some of my students and the, the marching in time, because it's something they don't actually have to think about. For example, the flex you get when you press your pick against the string before you actually pick the string, you have to kind of work out how much pressure to exert and when it will flick off to actually play in time. Until you learn that motion of when it will release when you're picking, that'll, that'll create some fine mistakes in the timing, which then make people think, oh, that wasn't right, that wasn't right, and they try and speed up, and they actually do speed up rather than speeding up the picking motion. So then they're going too fast for the metronome. Things like that I found have really helped. So if you get them in a group chain, maybe the added human element if you make the metronome louder, maybe he'll just be able to hear it and focus only on the metronome rather than the guitar, or just the body movement, so he doesn't have a difficult task to do while also having to play in time. So if you can make it as simple as possible, so just tapping his leg or something, something you really don't have to think about at all to carry out the actual action. It's just the timing of that action that's thinking. Yeah, just isolating, isolating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. That's excellent. Excellent, Ben. It's... You know, look, it's sometimes it's just a matter of uh, finding what works for that particular student. Um, you know, different students respond to different kind of things. And, you know, when I used to go in and watch teachers who would have different challenges with students, uh, you know, in the schools, the, the thing that I found um, in, in nearly every case was that, that they were just moving at a, a pace a bit too fast for the student. There was too too many... You know, they, the example that I give is they were giving them five balls to juggle before they could even juggle one and throw one ball in the air and catch it. So uh, what Ben's saying there is, is a good point about, you know, making sure that, you know, maybe not they're not doing guitar, maybe just clapping to, to the metronome. Get them, just break it right down to the most basic elements that you can find and keep breaking it down until you find where their starting point is. Um, yeah, there, there, there may be, you know... Kids love apps and, and games, video games and all that. There may be a video game out there they can use uh, to make this more fun. I don't know if anyone knows of anything, any any video game that requires timing, um, you know, in time for them to hit on the beat. I'm sure there's a few of them out there. Uh, I don't play games, so I don't know, but um, there must be we, a game out there. The we had a few. The we had a few that you have to get your timing right, like. Um, like you had like sports games, yeah, and you had to stand in front of the sensor, and you had to 
respond in in specific time to get it right. Get it right, yeah. yeah. And there's a dancing so, one, any, like aerobics yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and you know, dance is another good thing, uh, you know, to do if they can join a dance class or something like that as well, because it's all body and movement. So, all right, okay. So, onto the checklists. Um, the checklists, of, of course, they monitor pra the, the progress of the student. Um, and really, where I got the checklist idea from was the airline industry of all places. Um, he, the my my brother is a you know I, I don't know what you would call it a recreational uh, pilot. Um, he doesn't fly commercial airlines. He just flies small aircraft. Uh, during the flight and when they land, and so that that's why the airline industry is so safe is simply because they have these checklists, nothing gets missed. And I fit, so it, it made sense to me to have something the same with learning guitar. By having a checklist, I know uh, what needs to get covered so I don't sort of miss things. And if I'm preparing students for exams, then it's really important that we don't miss out on those things. And, and in Australia, they have what they call the AMEB, Australian Music Exam Board, and they have these exams. And it surprised me, actually, when I first looked at it, that there were no actual checklists for their exams to prepare students for the exam. And so I made our own ones, and that's really where I started, was making these checklists for the AMEB. But then I sort of you know, made them into the G4 method because the problem with the AMEB is that it started at, it's what they call advancing, it started at a level where you should have been really playing guitar for a year or two before you can uh, look at even preparing for an AMEB exam. So I thought, well, that's going to be too hard for the average beginner student, it's too slow. You can't take a seven-year-old and spend, because for a seven-year-old to prepare for the AMEB, it's really designed for teenagers and to prepare them would have taken years, so that's why I you know, put in all the checklists in between and the levels. So what that does is it ensures nothing gets missed by you, by the student, or by the parent. But the other reason, the main thing, the advantage of the checklist, which was one of my main motivations, was that I didn't have to do reports anymore because the, the standard question from parents especially was where is my child up to or what should they be practicing? And the checklist answered both those questions and I would explain that to them uh, in you know from the beginning, and I would also point it out through throughout. But I would say that this is what you uh, need to do. What's not even the boxes that are ticked, you still need to be revising those. But the boxes that are unticked are really what you're working on. We want to tick those off so we can complete the checklist, and then we can give you a certificate. And so the, and the parent said, well, what should he or she be working on? This checklist is what they should be working on. Um, and that's it. Uh, so problem was solved, and that, that was really the main purpose of the checklist. But it also gives you a very clear kind of point where you can bring students to back to all the time because, you know, we all, we all stray. We all go off target. And the same within your businesses is that you tend to go off, you know, and do different things. And people who run often run their own businesses, not just guitar teachers, but all kinds of businesses, they end up running these businesses that do all these different things. Um, and it was interesting because I, I had a, um, a referral from someone, you know, this, ha this happened all the time, but a referral from someone, you know, got to go and see this person um, about what you want for your business. Um, and I won't, I won't sort of go into detail what it was, but let's just say I, I was looking for a, some kind of solution to the business. So, and, and I said, okay, who is this person? And they said, oh, I don't know, it's a friend, but he's really good, you know, I know he's really good, you've got to go to him. Okay, so my first question is, have you done business with him, or is he just a friend? Well, I haven't had any reason to do business with him, but he's a friend. Okay, all right, cool. Um, he's a good friend, all right, I'll check, check him out. But the problem was that when I went to, because I asked for the website, and when I went to the website, what I saw was a list of all these different things that were totally unassociated with each other that he was doing, uh, from you know selling real estate to uh, building apps to um, uh, you know helping people to do marketing to teaching you uh, you know how to be fit physically fit or something. I can't remember there was various things, and it's like this guy is just trying to do everything. It, it, 
I, I don't, he might be good at something, I don't know, but from his website, it just feels like he's trying to do everything. I don't want to go to someone who's just who's trying to do everything. And this is what happens with most businesses, is that they stray off and go in all these different directions and try and do all these different things. And from guitar teachers or, or music school owners, um, is probably a bad example, but what happens to a typical guitar teacher? I went through it, so you know I'm no better than anyone else. Um, but you start off teaching guitar, and then you open your guitar studio, and you go, "Hey, what if I brought drums in? Cool, and bring a drum teacher in. What if I brought piano in? Yeah, great, saxophone and violin." And then you have this school with about 20 different instruments, teaching all these different things. And then you go, "What if I sell instruments?" And then you bring that, and next thing you have this kind of mega business of all these different things, and it's so much work. And it's so confusing, and you have no programs, and teachers come and go, and and it's just it's just a nightmare. Um, but that's what happens to most music schools. Um, that's where they end up. And from the point of view, if I bring this back to the the idea of the checklist, is that it's that this is what we do. This is what we're here to teach you. What's on the checklist is what you're here to learn. We're not going to go off on all these tangents. We're not going to get confused and lost about who we are and what we're trying to do. We're going to keep it very clear and very narrow. And you can go off and do other stuff if you want. Sure, go for it. But this is what we do here, and this is what Chief is all about. And let's become the best at it. Um, and that's that's really the, the checklist. Not only kept the students, uh, you know, on track, get me on track, get me knowing what I'm supposed to be teaching each week. Um, so yeah. All right. So the the other thing uh, is that it creates a game. And the analogy that I bring here is martial arts. Uh, if any of you have done martial arts or you know anything about martial arts, what happens is that you you go through belts. You, each belt, so you're basically doing a checklist. You, you, you've got to do particular skills. You do those skills. You perform the skills. You get the belt. And then you go to the next level and away you go. Uh, but interestingly enough, you, you often don't learn many new skills as you go up. You just get de keep developing those same skills but at a higher standard. And... But it creates a game. It creates where the students are thinking, okay, what I want to do is finish this level so I can go to the next level, um, complete, and there's a bit of a competition to see who can get to the end of the checklist fastest. But if there's no checklist and there was no sort of real program or no benchmarks, then students wouldn't feel that kind of competitiveness to try and uh, get better and, and, and work faster. It's not, it's not a nasty competitiveness. It's a, just, look, we're all racing for the line. Let's go, guys. Let's see who can get there. Uh, and that's really uh, the, the the checklist in a nutshell. So, has anyone got any questions on the checklist? I think it's pretty good. No, all good. Sorry, love you. Okay, great. Okay, so that's the practice log and the checklist covered. I think we've covered those topics. So, are there any other? Um, questions that anybody has? Yeah, the question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Now you go, Shane. You go first because you, you. All uh, right. Yeah. <clears throat> I was just wondering what um, people usually use as the first song because it's kind of up in the air about um, which one's the easiest because the, the Beatles one is quite. Difficult. I mean, most people can get it, but it's quite difficult for the first one. But and then the Sweet Home Alabama is good, a good choice. But some of the students, especially if they're complete beginners, haven't learned a D chord yet. You know, but yeah. it, it, when they do, it's easy because you can do it with the one finger chords. Sort of. Um, Smoke on the Water is a good one, but then to learn actually the rest of the song is is a bit difficult because the power chord is kind of hard for beginners. So I guess my, my question is, what's the first song that people usually use, and how much of the song are your students learning? Are they learning the whole thing, or just the opening riff? Whatever. Good song. Does anyone want to respond as far as what song you start on? I've got a non-checklist answer. Yes? I always go with Chuck Berry, You Never Can Tell, because that only uses the first three one-finger chords. And it's just that chord the whole way through. I get right. them playing just one, literally, of each chord. So they play the C and wait until they're changing to the G. Then they play the G. And there's that quick G7, C. And that's the whole thing. And they can play that only playing those, well, I guess, three chords, but four chord progression. 
and that's very little doing anything. Then they can play on the one. Then they can play on the one two. Then the one two and and you can build up to the full rhythm and show how a complex rhythm can be broken down. Right. So I use that as a way to teach how to read rhythms, how to make rhythms easier for themselves if they want to practice something complex. Here's how you break it down into its constituent parts. And it uses right. the easy chords so they're all happy and it's the whole thing. It's not, here are the chords except for this flash solo that you won't be able to learn for five years. Mm -hmm. It's just you can play everything in the song now if you want. Yeah. Yeah, because because uh, I've I've got no problem at all with um, finding songs, you know, very simple songs or parts of songs that are using the skills that they're learning uh, to 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 put those skills to use. Because it's just that you don't want to get off on songs that they bring in new skills that they're not ready for yet, because you just end up overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other reason yeah. I chose that one is because I noticed none of these songs have chords. You can finish Happy Birthday on a chord if you want. Or you can finish any of them on a chord, but none of them actually use chords, they're all melody based and while that's what people will recognise and find fun to play uh, look what I can play is the vocal line from this rather than what are those chords <laughs> if you know the song you'll definitely know there's this yeah, yeah, well um, so, so you're saying the, the uh, senior level uh, oh, no, sorry, I don't know, I was totally exclusively talking about the junior there Oh, you're talking about Junior. Okay, right. Yeah, no worries. That's Smoke okay. in the Water, Twinkle Twinkle, Jingle Bells, and Happy Birthday, all just melodies. So I no, thought no. I'd throw in one with some rhythm in so they're practicing a song with rhythm rather than just... Yeah. Yeah, I think um, Shane was referring specifically to the senior checklist. Yeah. 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 So, okay, cool. So the, the what I would do, Shane, is... is and you know, basically, what I would when I would start students on the songs, I would explain what the songs were about. That they were simply about learning parts of the song to memory. It wasn't about learning the song. The song itself wasn't really important. It was just about memorizing parts of songs without having any written music and just taking away. And each what I would do is each week I'd give them a little bit. I would bounce between the songs. I wouldn't teach them all one song and then move to the next song. Um, I would teach them a little bit of the first song. Uh, and, then, and then if it got to sort of, uh, you know, a point where I could see that it was getting a bit boring, a bit frustrating, and then I moved to another song, okay, okay we're going to do a little bit of this one now, um, and a little bit of this one, and I'd build them up throughout the course of completing the checklist. And, you know, there were obviously sections that are harder than other sections, so I would lead them into those sections by giving them a, a very simple exercise to, to help with that. It might be a picking exercise, it might be... Uh, you know, if you're looking at a, at a song like uh, the Beatles' birthday one there, rather than getting, getting thinking too much about the rhythm, I would actually make a scale out of those notes or, you know, an arpeggio, but just playing it straightforward, not worrying about the rhythm at all. Uh, and just say, okay, play these notes in this order. I'd take the first three notes and go, all I want you to do this week is practice these three notes in this order. One, two, three. That's it. Take it away. Um, does that make sense, Shane? Yeah. 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 That, actually, I was, I was going to bring that up about the Beatles one as well because it's, you know, they don't know an A7 scale, so it would be so much easier to play it if they knew the scale. That's the whole point of scales, right? Yeah. So I was, I was just wondering if, you know, maybe you should include that teaching, teaching the scale with the song. But it's kind of jumping ahead learning that scale because they don't really need to know it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, really, it's an opinion. Um, so it, it it definitely would help to know the scale because yeah, and that's the the whole idea of learning the skills. But in in the case of the song, we're not really trying to to teach them this the you know this that particular skill uh, with the song. What we're trying to do is teach them the skill of memorizing uh, yeah. sections. Yeah. Um, and and that's where you know, as you know, you know, the, with any musician, um, and and you're probably a fantastic example, because the fact that you play jazz bass, which is you know very demanding at times, it it, it you you can memorize, you know, you think about what you can memorize now and retain in your head. You've probably got hundreds of songs that you now can retain in your head without ever looking at a sheet of music. Uh, but take it, go back to when you first started on bass, that would s seem unimaginable. You know, so. and, yeah, because and it's, it's, yeah, you're building up blocks 
you know, going from learning things like 12 bar blues, you know, that progression that's a block. So you don't need to know every chord. You just need to know that it's in the key of G and then you know the chords that are in the 12 bar blues, 2, 5, 1, 6, you know. You know, as far as I know, you know, my my understanding of jazz when, when and I've done a bit of jazz is you just remember number sequences and then the rest of it so you know what key you're in. Is that how you think about it, Shane? Yeah. 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 Okay. So you know if I say to you it's a two five one six four um, in the key of A flat, um, you know exactly what we're talking about. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So so it's that's what starts to happen is through the teaching process of teaching songs, they actually learn to put things together and it, it get it, your brain gets working in a particular way and, and pieces all those bits together. So then they start to see that what seemed like you know a, a, a piece of music, like if I look at some classical music, it's just you know hundreds or even thousands of notes um, because I'm used to thinking as a guitar player, you know, in chords and. Um, that kind of structure. So when I look at a, kind of a classical arrangement designed for some instrument other than guitar, it, it, it looks it's very hard for me to sort of put it all together. But you know, for a classical musician, I'm sure it's very easy. Um, I'm sure they see all the patterns and they know it all works. So, um, all right, cool. Does that answer your question, Shane? Is that a yeah. Did we cover? It? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So, um, has anyone else got a question? It can be anything. It doesn't have to be with the checklist or practice log. Any topic that you want to cover. <clears throat> I, I noticed that the, some of the speeds have dropped off uh, the checklist. Um, and I was just wondering whether that was deliberate or, or whether they need to go back on. Some of the tempos? Yeah, the tempos. Um, I think, yeah, I can't remember exactly, but yeah. It, I think I'll give you an them. example. I'll give you an example, just so that you, you know, so the the GeForce, um, the senior level one, um, it, it had the strumming at 80 before, and now it's got no 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 bits per minute. Okay, all right. I'll ch I'll check that later, but I, but I did remove some of them. There were some tempos, I think, next to the songs originally, and and so forth as well. Um, because when 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 you read the like. Um, the document that says how you are assessed, it talks about speed and accuracy. So I'm just wondering whether we need that sort of guide to know, okay, how well, at what speed, you know, that kind, that kind of thinking makes sense. But I don't know whether there was that deliberate reason to remove it. Yeah, I think I did. And the thing that I would say about these things is don't, don't worry about getting too specific here. Um, and this is really important, is, is that, uh, you know, we're not trying to build um, a, a method that's absolutely precision to the, the you know, point zero zero of a, um, a beat or something like that. What we're trying to do is just create a bit of structure, create a kind of a guideline for you to go. So that's where you want to really uh, do your own interpretation as well. A little bit. You know roughly how far something should be, where it should be. So yeah, I think I can't remember which. But I did remember most of the places, and in most of the most cases, it was to uh, not to, to to sort of narrow it down too much because I know with different age groups as well. Sometimes you know with the younger kids moving through the junior levels. Uh, you don't want to be too strict on the tempos. You want to move them to the next level because as they get older, they actually speed up. Um, a child who learns at a young age will learn slower than a child who learns it. So if you take a five-year-old and take a ten-year-old, the ten-year-old will pick it up much quicker in the beginning, but the five-year-old will catch up later and will overtake them um, because of the fact that they, you know, it's it's to do with with the functionality of, of their nervous system, their brain, um, everything. As a five-year-old, five-year-old learns at a different level, uh, but they're learning at a younger age, so they a lot of those skills are being built in, and they're creating neural connections that allow them to be, you know, it's it's like a language. If you take a ten-year-old um, or even an adult, right, and learn a language a foreign language, take a five-year-old who's never learned that language before and take an adult who's never learned that language before, initially the 20-year-old will learn the language faster 
um, because they have the ability, they understand, they can read textbooks, they can, you know, they can take in more quicker. But the five-year-old will end up much better than the 20-year-old. It won't take long. I'm not talking from birth. That's a different case where you bought both, you know, from zero. Um, but generally, when they started, say, about five, and an adult, the adult will learn faster initially, and then the child will catch up and become a much more fluent speaker of that foreign language. Um, and you see it with adults all the time. I, you know, I went to school uh, with with immigrants from all around the world, and some of them came to Australia with their parents. And I remember very distinctly one of my very good friends. Um, his his parents, their English is really no better today than it was 30 years ago when I was at school. Whereas when he came to Australia, he had no English. Um, you know, and he was about seven or something when he arrived in Australia. Had zero English. His parents could speak. English, uh, but not very well. But they could speak it. But the seven-year-old, as a seven-year-old, he could not. Today he speaks fluent English. He, he, he sounds like an Aussie. He's probably more Aussie than I am. Um, and his parents still speak as if they got off the boat yesterday. Um, you know what I'm saying? It's that. It's it's a different. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. Sorry, this, David, I just ask about those tempos. I don't, I, my connection dropped out. I didn't know if we got the answer. So for the strumming yep. and the reading, have we got tempos for that, or is that entirely up to us? Or because I found it, it's a bit confusing for me it, when I'm about to, to refer to the checklist, and I think I don't want to make it too difficult, but then I don't want to do it differently to someone I've already explained it to, and then suddenly they come yeah. together like it took me ages to get through that checklist. Oh, I did it straight away. Oh, that's because I did it at half the speed that you did. Okay, let, let's have a look at an example. All right, I'll just bring up a checklist. Yeah, I can pop them on here if you want. You see that? Um, oh, I can't see anything on your screen. You just got a black. Oh, I'll just bring it up. It'll be easier for me to see. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, what level are you looking at there, Ben? The junior one and the senior one. The strumming and the reading both have no uh, tempos. Okay. Yeah. So, the, the, with the reading, yeah, I, I, I took the tempos off there because. It, it it just needs to be the same as the recording, okay. same tempo recording. So, so when we say reading from reading books, what do we mostly mean from the PGM? Because senior says lessons one to six of PGM book. Exactly, exactly. Reading so, says first string action. Yeah, and and to put a tempo there would be silly because every song is different. Some are some are slow, some are fast, some are medium. Um, so. They're, I mean, they're not widely ranged, but I couldn't put a tempo there. You know, it, yeah. it'd be like saying play Jingle Bells at one tempo and, um, you know, orally at the same tempo. So yeah, so we have different uh, speeds depending on what the song is. Um, so we're looking at the, the strumming exercises for the rhythm book. I think is probably where your biggest concern is. Is that yeah. correct, guys? And the, uh, the yeah. G four reading book, but obviously that's not as important because as long as they're playing to a meter, you know, they've read durations yeah. properly. Yeah, and they're just exercises, so the tempo is not really that important. Um, the and the rhythm book is just really in line with everything else there. You can see that it's 60 beats per minute. Uh, the picking is 80 beats per minute, but the rhythm book just 60 beats per minute. So in line with the chords. Uh, so yeah. Good, good. Thanks. Okay. okay, cool. Yeah, and yeah, you'll see. So really, what you want to do is. I think on the level two there is there, it says uh, 80 beats per minute there, yeah, cool. Um, and then 100 beats per minute. Okay, no, actually I remember now, the reason I took it off the first level um, was because I didn't want to set a tempo there, I wanted students to be able to complete that first level without feeling that pressure of getting to a certain uh, tempo. Um, I remember we discussed this, a couple of us. Um, so does that make sense? We don't want to, we just want to say, okay, you did the rhythm, at any speed, that's fine, that's cool, let's tick it off and then move to the next level. Yeah, that does make sense because that's the thing I was worried about, making it, choosing a tempo that was a bit too much because I don't know what your average student's like yet. So if I chose one because my first three students turned out to be incredible, that would cause problems later on. Yep, yep, okay. I think you cut out a bit there on me. Okay, um, yeah. So sorry, I didn't quite hear what you said there at the end. But but anyway, really, the yeah, the bottom line here is that we want to make that first level 
um, reasonably easy for students to to move through and, and to get to the next level. It's it's something that is quite common. Uh, it, it's it's well well known in Australia anyway that our exams, our government board exams, the first level, just about anyone gets through the first level as long as they're you know they're reasonably prepared. Uh, but when as you get up into sort of the second level is not too bad, the third level starts to get tough, fourth level is pretty hard and that's why a lot of students don't get past those kind of higher levels because they really do crack down at that point. They say by now you should know what to do um, and we expect you know you to really live up to the standard. But the first level they want people doing exams so they bring you in, build your confidence by you know, helping you pass the first exam pretty easily. All right. Anybody got a question? Fire away. David David Aldrich just added there, which is a good comment. Yeah, rock school examiners can't fail grade one and two exam candidates. Exactly. Yeah, get, get them in. <laughs> I know one of the examiners you see, and he told me that. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's probably an inside secret, but yeah, it's pretty well. <laughs> um, just a quick question, David. Yes, David. On on the level on the level one, the senior level one. I know the number of C minors and I think and the C seven. So um, there's a lot more courts to do. And are we still adding those into say say in the PG sorry in the book where we've got the courts like C D seven, A minor, E seven, A seven. Are we still adding those extra cards in the checklist for them to change? Um, sorry, Dave, you cut out a bit there, so I missed a little bit of that. So, um, can you just say it again? You're looking. Oh, what are we looking at here? Senior checklist. One. Uh, uh, you're breaking up a lot of me. I'm not. I'm not able to hear what you're extra saying. Extra cards. For from the previous. Um, can you hear me now? Um, I didn't hear. I just heard that, but I didn't hear everything else you said before that. Okay. Yeah. Um, on on the senior level one checklist, there's yep. been more cards added to the previous one. Yeah. So are we still um, using? We're using a lot more cards at level one. We are. Yes. Yeah. Brought in more cards. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we I kind of did that, and mostly because that part hadn't been revised really since I put the method together in the beginning, uh, and there was just this kind of bit of a gap between level one, and level two, and I wanted to try and get it to the point where by the time I finished level three, that really got most of those chords. So it meant sort of putting more chords into that first level. Yeah. Okay. So it, we did do a kind of a bit of a major upgrade this year, and that the kind of the last round, um, which was partly uh, inspired by Ben Al Qaeda, um, because he was going right through it all. So that kind of forced me to go back and look at everything much closer. And thank you for that, Ben, by the way. Um, and the, yeah, so that the, the idea was that that once I started really looking at it. Um, I saw the things that kind of needed to be upgraded um, and to bring it in line with, you know, to, just to create a better, a better method. I don't think it will change much now for probably another five years, but it, it definitely needed a few changes at this point. Okay. Okay, great. Um, all right, so Ben's put up a notice here. Um, Saying what we did, all the first students are setting on a real six standards. Okay, yeah, okay, cool. All right, so does anyone else have a question? Alex, is that a hand? I can't quite see it. Yeah, okay, I'll go Alex, then I'll go Fernando. Hang on one sec, Fernando. Alex, yeah? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, just to, following on uh, with the topic of the checklist, um, two little things. Um, the first thing is, I'm just wondering at what points is where's really the dividing line uh, between when you put a student on a senior checklist and a junior checklist because I've been sort of I know we talked about it a little bit like a while ago a year or two ago and Daniel was going like oh I'm swapping between 
senior and junior, but I don't know, I was just, just finding it a little bit difficult. And then when when the, the new round of checklists came in, I had some students on junior and some on senior, and it just got very confusing. So I've, had to, I've sort of split those groups up and just given everyone a new checklist and going like, right, we're going to start from scratch. Um, yeah, so, so I was just wondering what your take on that was. The, uh, okay, yeah, that's, and it's a good question. Is and, and we're sort of talking age here. You know, should you put an eleven or a twelve-year-old onto a senior, or should you start them on a junior, etc.? Is that the kind of question you're asking? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Gen generally, what what I would do it would start anybody up until about the age of twelve on the junior. And if they if they look like they you know in the in the intro, if you feel that you've got a student who uh, already knows guitar well or, or is quick to pick it up and you get to the end to that and you sort of, because that's part of what, what Ben brought up earlier, you missed that part, but about when to introduce the checklist and part of the intro allows you to assess the student before you decide which checklist to give them. Mm. So if you've got a 10 or 11 year old and you get to week five and realize this kid is a senior kid, you know, might, they might be 10 years old but they just, you know, they've done violin for four years or, uh, you know, they're in the school band and they know music inside out. So going to that you know, junior checklist might be a little bit too easy for them and you could already spot a group that's a senior level checklist group that they can go into. So I wouldn't rule any junior out, you know, really even as young as seven and eight sometimes you get some, some good students occasionally, not often at that age, but occasionally that are ready to go into the senior and they can go into the senior. So I wouldn't rule anybody out for the senior within that range, but what I would do would assume up until the age of 12 that they're going to go into the junior unless they prove otherwise in the intro. Now I can see that they're, they're picking up the reading really quickly. Uh, you know, the fundamental skills are coming together really quickly. So, so start them on the junior from unless you see any other reason to put them on the senior by the end of the intro. Okay. And and don't put them onto the checklist at all until they've finished the five weeks? Correct. You you what you, you can introduce it in the last week um, and say this is what we're going to be working on. And again, there's a couple of reasons why I do it. Some some of the things that, that I did with the the uh, G4 method and things and some of these questions are good because I'm having to go back and think why did I do that? Um, because sometimes I forget, but it comes through, as you guys will realize, it comes through experience when you do something a lot, you start to realize your better options, which is working, which is not working, or you end up in a particular place because this option wasn't working. Sometimes the obvious option doesn't work, um, and so you start experimenting with other things and you find that this is a better option. So, but, you know, introducing the checklist at the end, part of what I said to Ben before was to give them uh, something to look forward to, to say, okay, this is what we start working on from next week. If you introduce it in the first week of the intro, they're, they're already looking at the checklist thinking, okay, and there are some good points that Ben made, but, but they are also looking at that checklist thinking, okay, this is what I've got to work on, this is what I've got to do, and there's a good chance that they'll get to the end of the five-week intro already started on the checklist to a, to a fair degree and be thinking, well, now I know what to do anyway. I don't need you. I can take my checklist. I can take uh, what I've learned, and I can go away and work on it, and I'll come back to you, and adults especially will do that to you, uh, whether they'll say, look, I know what I need to work on now. Um, thanks very much. Um, I'll see you in six months when mm. I finish the checklist. I'll come back and have another couple, another round of lessons. Um, so yeah, it creates that kind of thing of all right. Now the real work begins. And this is why we call that an introduction because to, to introduce you to the skills that you're going to be learning and developing in the main course. This is just the entree. Let's go to the main course now. So. Yeah, but that's that's one of many reasons. There are a few other reasons that I could probably think about as well. So, is that cool? Yeah, yeah, that's all good. All right, okay, great. I'll go to Fernando. Welcome, Fernando. I think this is. Um, Hi. Uh, just, just so everybody knows, I'll, I'll just introduce you quickly, Fernando. Fernando's just yep. joined G4. He's been he was on the intro pack and, and looking around, but he's now officially a G4 guitar franchisee down in Adelaide. Um, and so, yeah, he's joined Jonathan down there. So good to have you here, uh, Fernando. So, yeah, fire away. Hey, um, I was uh, I was a bit late to the hangout, so you probably already discussed this, um, but I haven't had my first student yet. So I was just thinking, how do you, because obviously in the intro, and you only just touch on that briefly, you don't use checklists. So I was just wondering, how do you assess 
at which level the student's going to be. Do you, do you sort of do it in the background, thinking, looking at checklists, looking at the student, and then thinking, okay, this student's going to be at level three, or how, how, how do you work around that? Thanks. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a good question because there are exceptions to the general rule here, and that is that if you've got a student who has experience on guitar or in music, um, especially if they had, had experience in a stringed instrument like violin, uh, then you you really do need to pull out the checklist and assess them. Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Now, you don't necessarily have to give them the checklist, but you can have the checklist in front of you and say, can you play an A minor scale for me? Can you play a C major scale for me? Uh, you know, So that way you're ticking the boxes off and you know what they can already do. And that way, then, if there's any gaps in that, uh, which happen, sometimes with guitar players, what you get is you get them where they do know the, the basic skills such as uh, scales and some arpeggios and chords, but they've never done reading before. So what I tend to do in those situations is give them kind of the, you know, look at their technique, go through all that in that first person, but then get them straight onto the PGM book and say, okay, I want you to read uh, this and, and have a look at this, just these first couple of exercises this week. And that way I, I bring them up to speed on the reading because that's where they're going to, when they join the group, that's where it's going to be the area of concern is is they might join a, a senior level one group. They can already do half the checklist. The other people in the group have been learning with three, for three months. So they're already up, you know, to uh, orally or something in the PGM book, whereas the student's just starting out the reading. So you, you really say you need to get up to speed on the reading and then we can put you into this group. Okay. Um, yeah, is that cool? Okay, great. Excellent. All right. Can I just check and to be certain about something, David? Yeah, sure, checklist, Ben. Yeah. But we don't introduce the checklist until Lesson 5. You literally mean we don't give it to them until Lesson 5? We don't give it to, until Lesson 5, that's right. Okay, yeah. so it's not in the back of the folder. Uh, no, you, those, the, the checklists that, that are actually on the printout um, are really only there as part of because what happens is people can download that whole method as well. Yeah. So that's why they're there. Um, but you look, it, there's not a problem including it in the folder if you want to. Just don't don't uh, sort of go into it. Don't start. Yeah. You know, have the checklist and, and say, okay, we're going to start working on the checklist. The introduction is the introduction, and the checklist is. And look, oh, there were plenty of students who I said, you know, we're going to we'll be working on a checklist when you join the group, but for now we're, we're, we're on the intro, yep. Good, good. Excellent. All right. And let's... Is there any questions? Right, there you are, you're back now. Um, so is there any, any more questions? We might wrap up there if not. Uh, All right. And one. Alex. Yeah, uh, I was just trying to think of this. Um, just, just in terms of, um, yeah, going back to the, the senior checklist and things, when do you know, like, I've, I've been experiencing just recently um, a lot of really good successes with groups. I've just started grouping five and a lot of really, like, just slow train wrecks with them, um, so much to the point that I've had to break a few up, and that's worked really well. Um, but... <clears throat> At what point do you know, at what point are students too far apart to group? Because I had a, if I can just give you an example, I had like a group of two, I think they were um, level junior level two or level threes, and then three that were just on senior one or something like that. It was just a shambles, and it just became very apparent over a period of like uh, six weeks or so that it was just like, no, this is just not happening, and I just had to break them up. And since I've done that, um, it's gone really well, but I just... Want to know? Uh, it's in the future. How? What's the best measurement of? Okay, they, these guys will go well with with this group. Look, there's there's no real. I can't really give you an answer on that one because it's something you're just going to learn through experience. Um, as you start to work with groups more, you'll start to 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 get a better feel and a better sense of what's going on. Um, you know, as uh, you know, Lalo mentioned earlier, how um, he, he can, uh, I think it was Lalo, if I remember it correctly, um, he, he can read the students, he can get a feel for what they're thinking. Um, no, sorry, Lalo wasn't here, it was Adam earlier today. Um, yeah, a Adam was, was talking about how he can 
read the students now. He, he's got a really good sense of, of uh, what they're feeling and thinking uh, without them having to say it. And th th this is just one example, but in, in this case of grouping, you will start to get a feel for who's right for a group and who's not. And, and you'll get a feel knowing this is not going to work out. As you, you know, described it, train wreck, um, it, you, you will see that this is not going to go anywhere and it's probably even going to damage the group, um, having this particular person in that group where they may thrive in a very different group. Um, and, and I saw cases where um, a student who under one teacher was terrible. Um, they wouldn't practice. They were always... Uh, messing around and, and whatever, and then I changed them to a different teacher, and they sh they absolutely shone um, because the teacher just had a different way of doing things. So that particular student would would thrive under that particular teacher. Um, so there are different, and it's it's the same. And that's just the example of a teacher, but it's the same with having other company. You know, people are, are, are you put them into different situations with different people, they behave differently, and that's where if you move someone to another group. Never give up on them. Try them out. Try and move them and try and do different things just because they're not working out in this group. The children are very good at uh, misbehaving when they're, when they're nervous or feel uncomfortable. Uh, so you might put them in a group where the other students make them feel uncomfortable. Maybe there's a bit of um, anxiety there because the other students are more aggressive or older or uh, different in some way so the student doesn't feel comfortable. And you put them in another group and they might suddenly be very relaxed and happy and then they start you know, really participating well in the group. So, so it's hard for me to say from this point, you're just gonna, this is one of those things where you're just going to have to learn through experience. So. Yeah. Brilliant. All right, time's up. We'll end it there. Thanks, guys. Um, you can, for those of you who came late, you can always have a look at the replay as well. And again, if you, whenever you want to have a hangout, just nominate a time and a, a topic if possible. And yeah, and let's do it next week, regardless. Um, so hopefully, someone will come up with a topic by next week. But um, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll organise another date next week. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thanks, Dave. See ya. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.